So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the second of the uh, NC Invited Seminar Series and it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. or Professor uh, Jay Femiglietti. Um, now I've known Jay for quite a long time now, at least 15 years. We shared the same supervisor at Princeton, where he did his PhD under Eric Wood, one of the world's leading hydrologists. Uh, Jay was a professor at the University of Texas and then the University of California in Irvine before then spending four years at Caltech to launch a newly created NASA JPL Water Initiative. And that was a mission that aimed to bring satellite resources to bear on regional to global scale water security issues. I think it's a theme we're going to hear more about today. Uh, in 2018, he moved, uh, some might say defected, to Canada, where he occupies a Canada 150 research chair in remote sensing and hydrology at the University of Saskatchewan. Jay and his team have been researching and communicating about water and climate in academics, in business, in government, and to the general public for over 30 years. His research and commentaries have been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Economist, and he's a regular guest on NPR, BBC, and CBS radios, amongst others. He also has many film and television credits to his name, including the hit water documentary, Last Call at the Oasis, and it appeared on CBS News 60 Minutes, on HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and many other television and documentary appearances. He's a real international science communicator. Today, Jay is going to talk about some of the world's big issues, water security, its impact on food security, and the influence that climate change might have on both of these. Research areas that CAUS is deeply invested and interested in. Jay, thanks for getting up so early to be with us here today. I'm excited to hear your talk, as I'm sure the audience is. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. And, uh, like I said, I'll keep an eye on my chat box in case uh, our audio breaks down. Uh, just let me know. And uh, just as a reminder, if you could put your microphones on mute, I'm already starting to hear some, uh, some feedback. Um, uh, anyway, so let me get, get into it. Um, uh, so thanks very much for that um, introduction, Matt. I really appreciate it. And uh, I do want to give kind of an overview of some of the work that we did with the NASA GRACE mission. GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Kind of an unusual mission in that uh, it's monitoring variations in uh, uh, Earth's gravity field and, and therefore mass variations over the surface of the Earth that are, that are due to the movement of water. It uh, was a lot of fun to use and, and um, for me it was, it was um, you know, one of these, I uh, think, you know, message to students, um, you know, you never, you don't end up, you may not end up doing what you think you, you are on track to. I thought I was going to be heading straight from the work that I did. As Matt mentioned, I worked with Eric Wood. I thought I was going to build this giant model based on the work that I did as a PhD student. And uh, although I've done a lot of modeling, that never really happened. When I got to the University of Texas. I got, became completely enthralled with this uh, Grace mission because the, the science team, the head of the science team was there. There was a big community built up around it and they didn't know anything about water. It was a great opportunity. Uh, so, you know, play to the strengths around you when you move on to your next uh, positions is, is just a little bit of advice. Anyway, um, what I'm talking about today is summarized in several different uh, academic papers, but also in a communication paper in, a, in an article, which is called The Map of the Future of Water, which is where I got this title from. Uh, and uh, the, the link is at the end, but it's uh, part of the Pew Trusts think tank in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, uh, it was a great opportunity to write this summary piece and, uh, and have their support in communicating, especially around places like Washington, DC. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, so overview, I wanna start off with a very simple de definition of water security. Um, then uh, talk about what these GRACE satellites are, are showing. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done with water, food, energy, and human, uh, and human uh, security. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, and finally, the last bit, Matt uh, mentioned the science communication. The last bit is on, uh, is on science communication, this question, what are we going to do about it? And so it's a little bit of a call to action to 
to the scientific community to think about um, communication and, and our responsibility. Uh, okay. So definition of water security, you know, I use a pretty simple definition. It does a region uh, or can a region provide a reliable supply of potable water to its population, both now and into the future to do all the things that it, it wants to do. Looking at these pictures, those might be growing food, water for the environment, of course, water for people, water for energy production, water for economic growth. Now and into the future, you know, we have to be thinking about climate change, population growth, um, of course, the, the changing variability of the hydrologic cycle makes all that quite a, quite a challenge. So, so it's a simple definition. There are a lot of other definitions out there. Um, and, but that's the one, you know, I wrote it for a proposal many years ago and uh, just kind of stuck with it. I don't know if it's a good one because the proposal got rejected. But uh, anyway, I've been sticking with, uh, uh, sticking with that, uh, that definition. So what are satellites telling us about water security? Well, I um, use the GRACE, so I'm gonna talk mostly about the GRACE mission, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. <clears throat> and um, we'll show a few radar slides on, on subsidence due to groundwater, but uh, mostly everything I'm showing you is uh, from GRACE and mostly everything that I'm talking about today, there's been a paper written about it. Uh, mostly I'm talking about papers from my group, but uh, uh, lots of people have gotten involved in this, and I and I, I don't remember it. I may have some of their slides as well. So uh, Grace launched in 2002, uh, and it uh, uh, finished up, meaning you know the the satellites themselves ran out of power and the orbits degraded and all that um, in 20 end of 2017. And the Grace follow-on mission uh, launched in 2018, and we've started to see some of those first results. Um, uh, I like to say that GRACE functions like a scale in the sky. Oh, first you can see the configuration there. Those satellites are not very big, by the way. They are um, about the size of, uh, you know, I'm sitting at my dining room table right now, and each one of these satellites is maybe about the size of two of my dining room tables. So, you know, maybe they're, you know, three meters long and, uh, you know, a meter high. Uh, they are, they orbit around, uh, 400 kilometers and separated by about 200 kilometers. So I like to say they function like a scale because as, and they follow each other around in a tandem orbit, um, uh, a near polar orbit. So they're sweeping over the earth as the earth spins around. And I like to say they function like a scale because what happens is um, as the satellites pass over a place that's gained water mass, like a big snowstorm here in the Canadian Rockies, um, they get pulled down, you know, the, that region has a slightly greater gravitational attraction, puts a, uh, exerts a slightly greater gravitational tug on the satellites and pulls them down just a little bit closer. Stretches out the distance a little bit and pulls them down a little bit um, as they fly over the region. And sort of the opposite thing happens when they fly over places like, I spent so much time in the Western US to the, in the middle of this long-term drought, mega drought, actually, paper just came out a few weeks ago calling it a mega drought that was definitely driven by climate change. Um, it's sort of the opposite thing happens. So places undergo drought, it's losing water mass, and uh, uh, the region exerts a slightly greater gravitational tug on the satellites, and they float a little bit higher in their, in their, in their orbit. So by keeping track of the ups and downs and the inter-satellite distance, uh, we're able to map out the places around the world that have been uh, uh, gaining or losing water mass uh, over this entire time period. Some caveats, you know, it works at pretty large scales and lar in space and time, 150,000 square kilometers and greater, monthly and longer time scales. It measures the change in the total water storage, not the absolute amount, and it's the total, right? So all of the soil moisture and the groundwater and the snow and the surface water all together. So if we want to decompose that signal, we've got a little work to do. Um, Accuracy is about uh, one and a half centimeters, uh, equivalent water height, which basically means the signal has to be bigger than that, right? So just imagine a centimeter and a half spread over 150,000 square kilometers. That's the size uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that and greater is the, is the equivalent mass change that we can measure accurately. We can measure at smaller scales in space and time, it's just that the error goes, goes way up. Uh, okay. So that's Grace, it's been, been pretty cool. Can you see this animation okay? 
This is uh, the upper part of the Middle East here and Central Asia. This is from a paper that we published in 2013 and then uh, updated this for one of those. Uh, um, this was for 60 Minutes actually that Matt mentioned. And so you know, were watching this. This is one way we don't sit around and look at videos. All, well, we do now that we're at home, but uh, um, this is one way in terms of communication to really get the message across to people of what we're, what we're looking at, right? So, you know, you see that region go from this green to red color and it scares the crap out of people. So um, we don't quite make it down into your uh, region around the university, but I pulled out a time series um, and here it is for, for your region. And so, you know, um, that's not great. Um, so that's something to be, to be reckoned with and you know, better than I do what the situation on the ground is. And I've been out there and visited Matt before, and uh, I know that you folks are, are working on this. But anyway, you know, these are just a few ways we look at the data, right? We look at the time series. Each one of those dots is a monthly, uh, a monthly data point. You see the seasonality there, the, um, and you see the, the downward trend. And, and so, you know, it's, it's really, it's cool. So, it's important to, to look at these and, and understand these. Um, but it's also important to, you know, to do research on this stuff. Um, um, okay, so I'm, I'm just seeing your chat, your chat now, Matt. So I'm, I'm still okay? Okay, good. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's always important. I like to say, like, I like to do a lot of global work, but, you know, I've only lived in a few regions and investigated a few of these spots on this map that I'm about to show you. So. Uh, hopefully this can give you the information on storage change that we've never had before until the, until the grace, uh, until the grace mission. And it's our job to kind of unravel it in our, in our different regions. Okay. So this is one of the real, I think, um, to me anyway, real high points of the mission was to be able to put out a global trend map like this. We're looking at the trends now over the lifetime of the first grace mission from 2002 to 2017. Um, and the colors in the, uh, the colors represent places that are losing water like the reds or gaining water like the blues. Uh, and the deeper the colors, you know, sort of the hotter of the hot spots. Uh, so, uh, by the way, this uh, particular map was a long time in coming, right? I mean, we started working on this. Uh, Matt knows my former student, Matt Rodell. We started working on this when he was a graduate student. Uh, so, uh, we started in about 1996 by... I think Matt started in 95, and by 96 or 97, um, we started thinking about the Grace mission five years before it even launched. Uh, we're still working on it together, but you know, that's a couple of decades of work right there. Anyway, so kind of a cool map. And so let's look at what it's, it's telling us. There's a very strong climate change signal here. There's a very strong human fingerprint signal. Okay, so... Um, you can see the ice sheets melting, right? Greenland and Antarctica melting away, contributing to sea level rise about three millimeters per year, uh, as well as the Alpine glaciers. There's Alaska, Patagonia, and uh, Peru and Colombia. Um, we've got a background pattern, and I'll show you a separate slide on this, of, uh, of the high latitudes and the low latitudes in blue. The wet area is getting wetter and in between the mid-latitude areas drying, the dry areas getting drier. And I have a separate slide on that. Uh, we're starting to see, or we are seeing the extremes. And uh, the places where the extremes have been, have really buried a lot and there's been really powerful floods or droughts, you know, they're showing up to all over the world. Um, and one place, one area where we spent a lot of time in our group is looking at groundwater depletion. So there's this climate change signal. There's an interannual variation signal, which is probably driven by, by climate change. And this is very much a human water management signal here. A lot of what we see in those red spots are the world's major aquifers. Um, and they're being depleted uh, mainly for, to supply uh, water for irrigation. So, um, you know, this is something we really need to come to terms with because we need to eat and we want to do sustainable food production. Uh, and we want to be doing it for uh, a darn long time. So we better get our acts together on the disappearance of groundwater or uh, it's going to be tough to feed a, a growing population. So certainly a complicated map and one that I don't know that it quite keeps me up at night, but what does keep me up at night is 
like writing the proposals to do the research to like get the message out and really understand and really think about how we can uh, move, you know, how we can make it just seeing this map and doing all this work, you know, how do people like us who are academics, how do we try to make a difference in the world? That's the kind of stuff that, that, uh, that keeps me awake at night. So the climate change part, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the background colors of the wet areas getting wetter and the, and the dry areas getting drier, right? And so this is really an IPCC thing. It's been part of the IPCC from the earliest days. Here's this IPCC map about the precipitation uh, patterns. By the end of the 21st century, right, greater precipitation at high latitudes and in the tropics shown in blue and, and, uh, and less in the red and the, shown in the mid-latitudes. So this is for the end of the 21st century and, you know, we're, we're pretty much seeing it now. I used to ask whether we're, we're seeing it now. That's why the question marks are there. But we finally wrote a paper and uh, so the upper one is, the upper chart is the dry area is getting drier and that's, and the lower one is the wet area is getting wetter. And by the way, that's the background Just give me a second to come back. Uh, I'm sure it's just a little break in communication. Okay. Just tell me when I'm back. Good? Okay. So um, uh, this was a paper, you know, I was saying uh, that this paper got missed by a lot of people. And part of it was, a, again, you know, ironically, a communication thing. If you look at the title of the paper down at the bottom here, it's a decade of sea level rise slowed by climate driven hydrology. What happened is the media picked that up and said, oh, see, the scientists don't even know what the hell's going on. Sea level is slowing down. Sea level rise is slowing down. And really what JT Rager was trying to say here was that when there's more water stored on land, he's basically just sort of, you know, elucidating the process of when there's more water stored on land, it's not in the ocean, right? Um, and so anyway, it's... Uh, the contribution, I, uh, sadly, I think got lost because I think it was the first paper to really show that the wet areas are getting wetter and the dry areas are getting drier. Okay, so we've done a lot of work on groundwater and I just want to go and using the, you know, decomposing the grace signal, which again shows the change in the total water storage, uh, not the absolute amount, um, and into decomposing it into uh, soil moisture, surface water, groundwater, and, and, uh, and snow, and really focus on the groundwater part because this is a, a big deal as you've seen from, from some of these slides and hard to do using remote sensing. So of course this group knows, I don't have to really elaborate on what groundwater is, except that you know, it's a pretty incredibly uh, uh, important source of water for it's about, about a third of the population. It does provide about half the water for uh, for irrigation. A lot of people don't, don't know what groundwater is, especially when I give a public talk. So um, I like to uh, be very clear. So what do we do with grace? Well, we've got a sort of storage balance, which says the change in land here, uh, water storage is equal to the sum of the, the snow and the surface water, soil, moisture, and groundwater storage changes. And so we can do a little algebra um, and rearrange that. And, you know, we're going to use grace for the delta S land. And and for the rest of these, we're gonna use the snow, the surface water, soil, moisture. Maybe someday we'll do it all from satellites. That would be cool. But depending on the region we're looking at, we use different uh, data sources. There might be observations, there might be other satellites, sort of whatever, uh, whatever we can get our hands on. It's tricky internationally, actually, because there's not often a lot of data. Often there's not a lot of quality data sharing. Anyway, so Grace gives us the total change. And if we wanna isolate the groundwater, then we have to remove all the mass above the water table, the snow, the surface water, the soil moisture. We use these various data sources. I won't go through this figure, but it's, you know, we've got a lot of, did a lot of work in California, which is really one of the epicenters for groundwater depletion and written a few papers. Here's the GRACE time series for the lifetime of the first GRACE mission. And so down here, here we're actually doing a sort of a validation compared to an actual P minus E minus Q in the lower left. So good match. Um, but then we have soil moisture, surface water, snow water equivalent that we're going to subtract. So we're going to subtract the panel D in the lower right from panel A in the uh, upper left. Sources, soil moisture, we use the NASA GLDAS model. 
surface water, we're using reservoir storage uh, across California. Snow water equivalent, we use this product from the Weather Service. It's a blended model. It's the SNODAS project, so blended model observation assimilation uh, product. So subtract D from A and get this groundwater type. Oh, wait, what happened? Uh, intermission. This is what I used to work at NASA. I felt like I had to really advertise and say, someday we're going to do all this by satellite. And so these are some of the satellite missions that are coming down the road. So we know the follow-on mission. So we're going to do this in the future and move towards doing it all from remote sensing. Uh, we've got the follow-on mission, Grace FO. It's going now. ASO, our colleague Tom Painter has been, uh, and, and, and other people, you know, it's a big community. Uh, sorry, ASO stands for Airborne Snow Observatory. Our colleague Tom Painter, who was at JPL and now is sort of independent, uh, uh, has been looking at snow missions and in this case, how to do very high resolution snowpack measurements and estimating snow density and snow water equivalent uh, by aircraft. Um, SWAT, surface water and ocean topography should be around in a couple of years and SMAP, the soil moisture mission, which is, which is ongoing. So uh, that's something we can, can keep working on. That I, I hope I still have my, there it is. There's a groundwater time series. So this is what happens when you subtract. Remember I showed you that slide. Let's go back a little bit. Subtract panel D from panel A. Get rid of all that mass above the water table. And you get a time series that looks like this. Uh, so this is pretty cool. I mean, you know, in one sense, it's just another graph. Um, but it's pretty cool in that you can see the ups and downs in ways that you couldn't see before for the whole groundwater system. It's not going to replace observations. It's not going to replace the work that, say, the U.S. Geological Survey does, but it certainly complements it uh, and gives you that, that synoptic large-scale view that is otherwise really, really difficult to get. Uh, and so we see these two very important, these two red lines here represent these two very important periods of drought that happen so frequently and even more frequently now in California. In each one of those, there's sort of a step. You know, I, I, I look at this as sort of like a tennis ball bouncing down the stairs, right? Like during these drought periods, there's no surface water available. There's no snow in the mountains. We grow a lot of food in California. And so all the water gets basically sucked out of the aquifers to keep agricultural production up. And you know, you end up with these series of downward steps here during these droughts that for the most part, we're not replacing that water. This has been going on for a hundred years in California. That was one of the things that I messaged hard on in, uh, in California. I don't remember if I have, we did have some, some good luck getting some management passed. I don't remember if I kept the slide in or not but uh, we can see it, we can be surprised together at the end of the talk. Put this in the long, in the bigger picture. Now we're going back to 1960. And this is a combination graph. So we're looking at cumulative groundwater losses in the Central Valley in California, shown here in green. Red line is USGS, wells, combination of well data. It's their Central Valley model. It's a calibrated groundwater model, uh, calibrated with well observations. And then blue is grace here. And those colors in the background, represent whether it's a drought period, the tan, or a wet period, the, uh, the, the darker blue, or moderately dry, the light tan, or moderately wet, the, the light blue. And so, first of all, there's this overall huge decline. I mean, water table, average water table in California in the Central Valley is like 2,500 feet now. It's just crazy. By the way, it costs about uh, over a million dollars to dig a well that deep, uh, which, you know, the average person in the United States just does not have. So downward trend, um, but then look at these, right, these big drops during these droughts. Um, and it's basically, on, you know, it's not a situation we're ever going to recover from. We might be able to level off that trend or manage that trend, but uh, as long as we keep agricultural productivity up and rely on groundwater, um, this is gonna be a challenge. So yeah. Uh, lots of environmental damage. Um, uh, uh, the water table is really deep. All well, the streams have gone dry. By the way, you know, I lived in California for almost 20 years. I barely ever saw a running stream. I mean, up north a few more, but in Southern California, like nothing. Uh, so really deep water table, very expensive to, uh, to drill a well. So accessibility is becoming a problem. I mentioned I was going to show some radar slides. So subsidence is also a problem. 
Is this a famous USGS uh, scientist, a uh, picture of USGS scientist named Joe Poland standing in the middle of the valley in 1977 next to a telephone pole where the ground, where, where the ground surface was has been, has been marked, right? So 1925 is way up here. And uh, can you see the arrow uh, as I move the arrow around or do you not see the arrow? Matt, you see it? Okay, okay, so 1925, the ground was up here. Here's 77, All right? So, you know, that's pretty scary. Um, so subsidence, again, most of you folks know we're talking about, uh, you know, it's kind of like a tire deflating, right? You let the air of a tire, it flattens out. In some aquifer systems, you pull the water out from the aquifer or from the surrounding layers, uh, especially those layers that have clay minerals in them because the clay minerals are flat and so they tend to stack up and, you know, neatly compress. Um, and so in those aquifers, and the Central Valley's got about 25% of the aquifers uh, have clay minerals, um, uh, we're getting a lot of subsidence. And in that drought period, in that time period I show there, which was at like 2011 to 2015, that was the fastest ever. It, at some points it was dropping about a meter per year, uh, which is crazy. And of course, any infrastructure that sits on top of that is a huge risk. So we're looking at this region here, Right around UC Merced, by the way, here's the Bay Area here on the left. And uh, here's the middle of the Central Valley, University of California, Merced. If anyone knows Roger Bales, he's, he's over there. Um, so we're looking at radar data and uh, from my colleague, Tom Farr at uh, JPL, now he's retired. And so there's this big subsidence ball, which is a few inches per year in this first phase of the drought. But then in this second phase of the drought, which was much more severe, I mean, you're up to like a you know, meter and a half per year of subsidence. And by um, uh, 2015, there were some places that were up to a meter per year. So uh, JPL was eventually contracted to uh, do some maps every few years on subsidence. And I left, so I don't know how that's going, but they were gonna do it at higher resolution using UAV SAR for the whole state. Uh, so, you know, a real uh, difficult consequence, uh, unfortunate consequence. So here's Joe in 77, and I Photoshopped him to be like 2015, right? So we went from there to there. Um, so pretty, pretty frightening stuff. You know, when you put that whole package together, it's not great. Back to communication, you know, I you know, showed you those animations. I might have a California animation, but this is a graphic that's just the outtakes from one of those animations that we did for California. This graphic, which by the way, okay, I did this myself, which is one of the few things that I like have actually done myself in decades. And like, I just sat down at my kitchen table one day, took a bunch of, yeah, literally just ran the video, did some snapshots, put it together. And man, this thing, you know, okay, it's not viral, but I mean, it showed up like in the neck, in the news, the next day, it was on the national news. Um, in the United States. It was in the LA Times. I actually had a taxi driver that was going somewhere. And, um, and you know, I talked to the taxi drivers like, like I often do and asked him about water. And he said, hey, did you see that, that picture in the paper about the, like the red and the yellow and the green? I'm like, yeah, dude, that was me. Um, my point is, um, simple communication can be extremely powerful. And I, you know, I didn't think about it when I was doing it. I knew I wanted to make a simple graphic. I was not thinking about the implications, but, but that's one of the reasons why I show this. This thing is like, it just had a life of its own. Uh, okay, other animations. Uh, so I've got California and India. Um, Matt, are these looking okay? Can you guys? They're playing, Jay. You're uh, you're stalled, but uh, I know you'll come back. Back yet? Okay. Did you see those? Should I rerun those animations? That might have been what killed us. Did you see those at all, Matt? Sure, they they played. They played. Okay. All right. So you know, just remember, like you know, blue to red is bad. That's all you need to know in this class. Um, okay. So the groundwater bit, you know, this is really, really concerning because a lot of the stuff, the wet air is getting wetter, drier is getting drier, the ice melt, the um, 
changing extremes. That's part of climate change. And, and uh, we can't, man the only way we manage it is by managing climate change. What I'm getting at is groundwater is something we directly manage. So we better get our acts together on this. And that's hard globally because, you know, for the most part, we don't do it. Um, and uh, so, you know, just focusing in on these, I had a student named Sasha Ritchie that wrote a paper doing sort of a stress index on groundwater. The, the reason I show this image, say, compared to this one is, it's got an aquifer template. So we took the trend map, mapped it to this aquifer template, did a bunch of other stuff, but you know, a real important message of this particular figure is that over half of the world's major aquifers, these are the major aquifers from the YMAP project, a UNESCO project, 37 major aquifers, over half of them are being depleted. Many of them correspond to the world's major food producing regions. So, you know, we're in a bit of a, uh, a, rough, a rough place here. Those are just some of the time series for some of those aquifers that I just showed you. This is from a paper called The Global Groundwater Crisis that I, that I wrote in uh, 2014. Okay, so let's talk about some implications and uh, some things that you know, we should be thinking about. And it, it, there's no question that this is a huge challenge for us and a huge challenge for us as academics to actually figure out what to do and communicate about it. Okay, so I hope I get the message across. We look at this map, that human fingerprint on how the freshwater landscape is changing, right? Uh, climate change, ice melting, changing extremes, and water management is the dominant force. So it's really the human fingerprint, right? That is driving that whole map. Uh, and it's happening way faster than most people realize. Um, and of course, it's threatening water security. I mentioned food security. We could go on with all the S words, human security, environmental security. I mean, there is a lot at risk here. With respect to food production, one of the things that um, I've started messaging, at least in California and some of the other places that I've worked, food production, you know, most places that are in the red there, most of those aquifers, it's really chronic water scarcity. It's not drought. Okay, drought comes and goes and you know, everything is fine in between, but if you keep depleting your aquifers, you're using more than you have, right? I mean, it's obvious to us. Um, it's not obvious to the, to the public. Um, and so we need to be working on that message. I think there's lots of solutions for metropolitan regions, um, for sustainable water use in metropolitan regions. But food production, man, you know, it just uses so much water that we need to bring out all of the, you know, the big guns, uh, the policy guns, the financial guns, the conservation and efficiency guns. And, you know, we're not going to really do anything on the supply side, uh, you know, a little bit. It's really on the demand side. Um, I like to ask this question only because it's a little provocative. But when you see the maps and you see those uh, uh, aquifers running out of water, you know, you have to, and, and you realize that the food system is optimized. Like it's, you know, it's optimized in the United States to uh, uh, around the Central Valley and around the Southern uh, High Plains aquifer, uh, you know, it's optimized. And so as the water disappears, will the agriculture move to where the water is or will we decide, you know, food systems optimized, here it is in California, you know, here it is, whatever, you know, the, uh, North China Plain, uh, the Huarani Aquifer, you know, it's optimized in those regions. And so maybe we'll just truck water and, you know, move water there. This is a question we're gonna have to grapple with. I also like to point out that food related problems are water, pro uh, food related water problems are national and international water problems, okay? You know, shopping here in Canada and uh, you go to the produce section and most of it's coming from California. Um, so problems there are problems here. Uh, and that's true in many places around the world. Uh, you know, on the socioeconomic side, I'm not sure we're really prepared. Yeah, it's a tough time to message on this right now with the, with the global pandemic. But in general, society's not really prepared for this, this uh, food and water and energy future that we're confronted with. We're, we're really having accessibility issues, the haves and have nots. Do you live in a blue area? Do you live in a red area? And I don't mean politically, I mean, I mean from water quantity. Uh, 
uh, you know, you live in one of these places that's gaining or losing or they're gaining too much or, you know, is it Goldilocks? Is it just right? Suppose you live in the Central Valley or you live in over, in, over one of these aquifers that's being depleted. Maybe the big uh, food industry can afford to spend the millions of dollars it, do it needs to to uh, drill these wells, but, but we can't. Conflict, always a threat in some of those regions on some of those maps, they're, they're transboundary, there are places that are, where we know people have historically fought over water. And certainly we need to be thinking about transboundary uh, water law uh, and just in general groundwater policy, which, you know, where I've lived in the United States and Canada, it's just in its, in its infancy. Um, so we need to be thinking about that, that stuff because that's the only way to keep the red colors in those maps from getting, getting redder. Wrote a paper called the uh, Global Groundwater Crisis a few years ago. In it, I sort of said, you know, here's some things we need to do. We need to really sort of understand that we use more than groundwater than we have available to us and therefore we're depleting it. And damn it, you know, it's really important for us to understand how much water we have uh, how much water we need, how those things are changing over time. So that means we actually need to explore our aquifers and figure out how much water is there, just like we would if they were oil reservoirs. We need to be doing much more measuring, monitoring, you know, uh, reporting, sharing data. This is not rocket science to us, but it actually is in the, in, the, in the greater community. We need to be managing surface water and groundwater together. It's always kind of funny in California when uh, you know, they'd say, the state government would say, oh, well, it's a drought, so there's no surface water available, but go ahead and use the groundwater. Um, you yeah, know, that's a zero sum game. And I mentioned this a little bit already, but groundwater really is a critical element of national and international water supplies. Um, almost always gets left out of the discussion. And so we need to, we need to change that. There's that paper, that was a 2014 paper, easy reading. Uh, okay, what are we gonna do about it? This is the bit on communication that Matt mentioned. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, there's really an urgent need uh, for the science, regional and global science. We need engineering and water science and policy innovations. And we need to get engaged, okay? Um, because we're the ones, you know, you folks that are listening to this conversation this morning, you're the ones that are doing the work. You have the expertise and you have the knowledge. I mean, look at what's happening in the United States right now. I mean, science has gone like out the window, right? We have to fight to get that back. And, uh, you know, I know it's not like that around the world, but many scientists are not really comfortable uh, taking that step. I'm encouraging you to do it because the policymakers, the planners, the stakeholders, the public really needs us. There's a real urgency now with global change that's driving, that's driving a, a lot of what's happening in that map. Um, and so we need to really engage more deeply and uh, we need to start pretending we're the smartest people out there and really think about what, you know, buzzword these days, but co-develop key questions. Um, it's not enough to sort of walk into a Department of Water Resources and say, hey, Here's our, here's our new, you know, drought tool. Uh, we need to co-develop this stuff. Um, can you hear me okay? Right now? Okay. Um, so the other thing I think it's super important for us to do is to do the highest quality work we can. That's really our niche. So we keep going with our peer reviewed papers. I'm not saying that we should communicate just for the sake of just talking. What I'm really saying is, you know, we do the best work we can. When we hit something important, we need to communicate about it. Or if you're working on a tool, right, that, it, that you think is a real game changer, you know, make those connections, let people know about it, communicate about it. Um, and I mentioned before, you know, we really need to be working with uh, all the different sectors and disciplines and even transdisciplinary going outside of our, of our, of our universities. Um, okay, this, so getting, you know, kind of wrapping it up here. Um, um, a lot of what I talked about is summarized in this explainer article called, uh, the, the magazine is called Trend, and the link is here, trend.putrust.org. Um, and of course, there's all the papers. You can just Google those and find all the different research papers, and some of those are 
uh, were in the PowerPoint. Uh, that's what the article looks like. Uh, just skip over that. Oh yeah, okay, so I do have, you know, a lot of my message is doom and gloom and, uh, uh, but sometimes the, the communication stuff, you know, comes to fruition. And so a lot of us in California, and what I mean to us, a lot of us on the academic side, worked really, really hard to get the message out about groundwater depletion and what was happening in California and really sort of expose some of the science and the basic water balance, right? In ways that maybe some of the state agencies weren't doing. It was extremely helpful in getting what we call the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014 on the ballot in 2014 and passed. And now it's being implemented and has, okay, as you know, full disclosure, has an incredibly long implementation timeline. Like it started in 2014, and it won't be, won't be fully implemented until 2042, but uh, it passed. It was extremely flexible and deals with a lot of things, albeit in a very flexible framework. Like you see here, uh, need to really limit these undesirable results, groundwater uh, table lowering, uh, reductions in storage, seawater intrusion, degradation of water quality, subsidence, and surface water and groundwater together. So there's a lot in there. So it's a success story and maybe one that could be mimicked around the world. Um, at least that's our, that's our hope. Okay, so, so I've got a couple of slides on more information. So there's the trend, uh, magazine issue, nice easy reading. Uh, Institute website, I'm at the Global Institute for Water Security now. Uh, Twitter, always looking for new, uh, new Twitter followers. And I did want to highlight this. Uh, so I started a podcast and, uh, you know, uh, it's a communication thing. Um, and it's available, did we finish season one? I think it got, you know, we just jumped into it with no experience. Uh, by the, we did, I think we did 10 episodes, you know, by the end of the season, it got pretty good. Um, so it's not at all the usual podcast places, but let's talk about water more broadly. Uh, it's something that, uh, uh, started, um, uh, I don't know, over a decade ago, um, uh, with uh, my colleague, Linda Lilienfeld, and she's sort of taken it around the world. And then we just came back together recently and repartnered. We did the first one of these at, uh, at UC Irvine, uh, you know, it, so we call the podcast, Let's Talk About Water, but let's talk about water as a broader umbrella for using film as a vehicle for science communication. Um, and um, so the various Let's Talk About Water events have been organized all over the world for the last, uh, over, over a decade, since, 2000, since 2009. Didn't want to point to, this was supposed to be this uh, Let's Talk About Water film festival, it was supposed to be a real film festival. Uh, in Saskatoon this summer. And of course, that's not happening. But there is a virtual film festival. And you might want to check it out. There'll be a weekly feature film that starts, there's sort of a placeholder there right now. But next week, uh, for the next five or six weeks, there'll be one film per week. We're also doing a short or did a short film competition, two minute films. Some of them are done by middle schooler and high schoolers. So there's a student competition, and there's an international competition. So worth checking out. And the website is just let's talk about water. And that is it. I'm done. And uh, looks like we didn't have that many interruptions, which is uh, uh, audio interruptions, which is, which is good. That's great, Jay. Uh, thanks very much. I'll, I'll take a couple of seconds for people to uh, virtually applaud you. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sure we've got uh, enough time to have the audience ask you some questions. Uh, I've, I've got one uh, as the host prerogative and uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, sp uh, guests here, uh, June Navrahano, he runs our Office of Research Strategy, he's posed it very nicely. So I'm going to uh, read that out directly. Okay. Uh, how is the heightened global health concern related to COVID-19 pandemic potentially affecting the campaign towards water sustainability? <laughs> In what ways is the pandemic a challenge or an opportunity or a null effect in terms of communication and action needed. And I'm gonna add the element that I wanted to talk about, which was this push towards resiliency. Yeah. We have so much of our food coming from other places. I think we're gonna see a big shift towards national food security, national resiliency. I'd love to hear your yeah. comments on that. Yeah, so I do think, uh, so uh, as an opportunity, I think um, 
you know, globally, we're talking about rebuilding better. And, and I agree with all that. So I think there's an opportunity. We've had such a pause. And, you know, of course, while we're having this pause, we're seeing the air get cleaner and the water get cleaner. And uh, so it uh, gives us a lot of time to think. Um, so I think there's great opportunities there to, to, to rebuild. I, I really do. Um, and we still have, still have time. A lot of places are sort of opening up slowly. And it will be a lot, of, you know, a lot of downtime, I think, to really rethink things. So I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's an incredible opportunity. You know, there's many challenges on the challenge side. Um, accessibility is a big one. Um, you know, places that are having service interruptions or didn't have, you know, a lot of our indigenous populations in North America don't have reliable water access or access at all. And when the number one thing you're telling people to do is wash their hands all the time and they can't wash their hands, of course, this is a huge problem. Um, so that's been a real, a real challenge. And then more broadly, communicating about this stuff, uh, it's not the best time in the world, right? It's just tough to, I mean, there are, no, we need to communicate that those two things are related, right? Especially on the accessibility part, but it's really tough to get any attention on any of this stuff, right? And we're seeing that all over, all over the world. So it's a challenge, but, uh, you know, again, in the challenge comes the opportunity. We can take the downtime to sort of plan. That's kind of, I'm writing a proposal actually on global groundwater sustainability right now. It's a Canadian uh, uh, funding opportunity, but a global, global reach. And so, you know, I'm taking advantage of the downtime to think strategically. So, you know, overall, though, it's a challenge. You know, you've, you've brought up the science communication element uh, quite a bit. I've always uh, appreciated how how uh, you, know, you really put yourself out there to uh, to spread the message. But uh, you know, it's as much personality as it is credibility. And I'm wondering, you you just mentioned at the beginning of the of the talk, you're going to run a course, a virtual course, this semester at least, on science communication. You know, can you train someone to be? Can you train a scientist as an engineer who aren't naturally uh, great communicators to uh, fill that gap, to be that presence in the, in the media? Um, so, you know, it's not, okay, so uh, I think everybody can improve. And just a side note, like, um, I, uh, I, I get into it sort of gradually, but when I, when I was an assistant professor, I just had no confidence and no interest. I mean, I literally, like, would not call reporters back. Uh, so maybe the answer is yes, because I don't think I had any particular skill and I sort of uh, got into it over time. But I think everyone can improve, but I also think that you do have to have a comfort level, right, with it. I mean, you have to have some credibility that comes with age, right, and writing the papers and, and all that stuff. Um, uh, so everyone can get better. Not everybody needs to do it. Not everybody wants to do it. But I think we should all try to get better, especially those of us that have really important stuff uh, to, to share. You know, we just cannot really rely on our usual academic process. We just can't. No one's ever going to go looking at water resources research, even when we highlight those papers. Like, it's just not something that, that the general public looks at. Uh, a question here from Vanessa uh, related to the grace signal. Uh, how does large scale grace landmass change impact the interpretation of that signal? Uh, the question is asking, in particular, to the northwest Australia, where we've seen uh, increase yeah. in the uh, wetter climate, but large scale iron ore and other mineral uh, you know, exploration and, and export. Yeah. So, you know, interesting question about northwestern Australia. <coughs> And I've always thought, but never really been able to prove. So two things going on. Okay, so let me actually answer the question. The earth mass change part, the biggest things that really impacted are huge earthquakes. And then post-glacial rebound, right? So those are the, or those are the two big things. Things like mining. Um, we've looked at the mining numbers, and we looked at the mining numbers in northwestern Australia because there's a big red spot there. And they're not as big, right? They're sort of second order. They're sort of second order. But what is a big thing there is the actual water water use, right? And so as far, you folks look frozen. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Okay. 
so, you know, I think what we're looking at is a water use uh, uh, in, in Northwestern Australia, water use for mining. That's my guess, never been able to prove it. Um, not that I've been, never been able to prove it, it's just, you know, over my capacity, my threshold, my capacity to actually do the work. So that's my hypothesis. Also something else going on there is that, uh, uh, you know, there's a bit of that drought signal showing up there. I mean, there's some climatological stuff that's happening in Northwestern Australia. I think it might've been really wet before the GRACE mission started and then it wasn't as wet. And so everything's sort of relative to what's happening there in Northwestern, uh, what happened before the uh, beginning of the mission. Well, yeah, it's, it's a question I've also thought about, you know, coming from Australia and, and again, how, not having the time to go and spend time with it. But even locally here in Saudi Arabia, we pump huge volumes of, of water into aquifers to extract oil, but export, you know, millions of barrels of oil a day outside of those aquifers and I, outside of those reservoirs. And I also wondered whether that was a signal that you could uh, yeah. check, whether it's beyond Grace's ability. Well, so, you know, Matt, it just comes down to the size of the signal, right? And so that's the answer right there. I mean, the answer is always going to be yes, if it's big enough to perturb yeah. the satellites. Exactly. And then that's when, you know, it gets really hard. You know, it's going to take you folks in Saudi Arabia to work on that problem, right? I'm not going to get the data on the North China Plain aquifer. The mining data in Australia is really tough to come by, right? So, I mean... It's, it's just physics. If the signal is big enough, you know, the answer is yes, but it's up to us to, to pull it yeah. all through the water. Uh, a somewhat related question, uh, drawing the, uh, the attention, you also want to ask, in the map you indicate some cause of groundwater reduction, such as ice melting, uh, agriculture, etc. Uh, have you found any evidence linking fracking activities with groundwater depletion or subsidence? You know, for instance, the red area in Texas. Yeah. Um, so not, you know, yes and no, not, not, spe haven't specifically pulled it out. Um, I think the thing with fracking is, uh, so, you know, little knowledge is, is dangerous, right? So the few times that I've dove deeply into, um, fracking, what you find is that it's very, the water supplies that are being tapped into are very local. So not going to have that large scale uh, impact that you see, you know, uh, in Grace, but they're huge. I mean, they in the, you know, in certain regions, you know, I paid more attention to it in California In certain regions, they can just suck all the water out of the ground. Um, so, um, you know, yes, yes and no. Some of the stuff is, uh, again, to see it with Grace. So you can absolutely see this stuff with different satellites, right? Um, uh, that are higher resolution. To see it with grace, it's going to be really big and over a really long period of time. One place uh, where it does show up, uh, not fracking, but, uh, but the tar sands is in, uh, you may be able to see it. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but the uh, area of, uh, can you see this, Matt? Can you see the yeah, map? Here? Yeah, hey, so this area up here, that uh, impinges upon, especially right over here, um, the tar sands, the Athabasca tar sands region, are use like just incredible amounts of water. Um, so again, that's another region where, um, you know, okay, I live in Canada now, so I should probably tackle it. But like, when I lived in the U.S., I would say, well, you know what, you need the Canadians to go figure that out. Uh, it's also a little bit more challenging. So there's tremendous water use. It's probably showing up in this signal. But when you look, like you head towards the ice sheet here, this whole region is still undergoing post-glacial rebound and quantifying that over a big area is, is tough. So it, there's, there's some uncertainty. I mean, just the logistics of doing a study like that would require a lot of like GPS to, to understand not only, so get the data on the mining and the water use for, for the tar sands, uh, but we'd also have a, need a separate set of data on the post-glacial rebound, which we don't have. Uh, so, Jake, a question from uh, Mark Test, one of the professors in our Center for Desert Agriculture. Uh, he also noticed the seasonality oh, yeah. of the, uh, some of the signals. And uh, the question uh, there is, oh, uh, many plots show annual oscillations suggesting seasonal recharging. So is there a possibility of recharging many aquifers if removal pressures were reduced? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, and if we're talking about this all over the world. I mean, uh, there's two parts to the question. One, okay, if we slow down the, uh, the rates of pumping, then, you know, the aquifers uh, will recover um, or will partially recover. Some of those aquifers, uh, because of the subsidence, the storage space is gone, it's gone permanently, like the rocks have like fused together, there's geochemical stuff that happens. So, you know, it's not coming back. There have been some recent studies. But uh, definitely possibilities, you know, it all depends on the aquifers. The ones that are closer to the surface can be more easily recharged. The ones that are deeper, you know, a lot of pressure, don't know that they can be easily recharged. We just use so, so, so much water that like, you know, the recharge water, you know, is not, is not really there. Um, so yeah. oscillations, you know, there's, so, I mean, there's been lots of studies on the seasonality of groundwater recharge and seasonality and aquifer level. Some of it has to do with atmospheric pressure. Some of it has to do with actual water use. Some of it has to do with recharge. So that's been well established. I'm still reading your question about the telephone poles. Um, so I don't, you know, uh, I just take it on faith that it's a realistic question. But the pole, I mean, the pole is sitting on top. So it's, you know, I mean, it's not that deeply, it's not that deeply rooted. So, I mean, good question. But, you know, the ground, it's not like the pole is stuck and the ground is, is moving up around it. Although there is a little bit of that that happens, I think. Uh, um, uh, and that happens in some of the wells, some of the new wells that are being built is sort of accommodate that sort of, you know, sliding around. But for the most part, we're looking at it, it moving up and down. So Can I a... just ask, just, Sorry, just, go, go. just on top of that, you had quite strong oscillations with the Kalst region aquifer signal or water signal. Yeah. I'm just wondering how you could get that because in this region, it just doesn't rain or anything. We just... Yeah. Have... <laughs> so the, the, the answer there, uh, Mark, is that the oscillations weren't strong. It's the, uh, it's the y-axis was... <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you okay. probably also see some coastal effect there, Jay, as well, right? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. But you yeah. do still see those oscillations in the, uh, the centre of the country, particularly up in the north. Uh, yeah. We're trying to diagnose that. I think some of it has to do with the seasonality of agricultural production as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much to it that uh, the only way we're going to get all the answers is if people sort of dig into their, dig into their region. So there's a couple of questions here, and, and we, we might draw it to a close shortly after that, about uh, strategies for preserving groundwater with a managed jack for recharge, etc. But I think the uh, overriding question there is when so much of our food production systems rely on these groundwater systems, what, what, are, our, what are our alternatives? to, to uh, preserving some of these fossil aquifers or even the uh, you know, normal aquifers that are being recharged, but water's being diverted from them for, for food production. Uh, you know, that's the, the multi-billion dollar question, right? It, the, answer, the answer to that. And I think uh, there's no one thing that's going to happen. So, I mean, obviously we have to figure this out. There is tremendous waste, right? I mean, when you look around the world and look at how much flood irrigation is still happening, I mean, let's just talk about some macro things like flood irrigation, crazy, uh, you know, growing the wrong crops in the wrong places, also crazy, you know, free access to water, you know, lack of understanding by governments of the importance of groundwater and the finite nature of it, you know, getting rid of all the dietary changes. I mean, we could go on and on and on and make some small changes that would carry us out, you know, probably a couple of hundred years. Um, but, you know, we, we you know, need to be thinking about longer than that. And so a lot of it, I think, comes down to, and that's what this, I keep talking about this proposal that I'm writing. And today, today's a holiday here, by the way. Uh, it's uh, Victoria Day. And I was hoping to get, uh, to, you know, get up early, do this talk, and then launch into uh, working on this proposal, which is on global groundwater sustainability and governance. Uh, and I'm probably not going to do that, but, you know, it sounded good, you know, Friday, it's starting to seem like a good idea. Um, you know, the governance part is really difficult too. You know, I was in Bangladesh. You know, you look at our maps, and especially the aquifer specific map, the one place in the world that is the worst is Bangladesh. And so we were there in February, just before the virus stuff went off the charts. 
And I was like in the Ministry of Agriculture and talking to the, I mean, the Ministry of Water and talking to the, he wasn't the number one guy, but he was the number two guy. You know, you can't really get closer to the seat, right, than, than I was. And man, I mean, he didn't care. It's like, yeah, you're right. Let's sign an MOU. Like, uh, like the MOU was the prize. I'm like, uh... I don't know, man. So, you know, sometimes I'm really, so, so the question becomes, we can do things in our own countries, but to do things globally and to inspire and to motivate other regions, and that's kind of what I'm thinking about in this proposal, is really, really hard. So I, I don't have the answers, just some combination of all those things that we talked about. I think, you know, globally raising awareness, that's why the communication is so strong, right? Building community, raising awareness, to motivate these different regions to take on governance and then management will hopefully lead to improved sustainability. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, well, I, I, now you mentioned the optimized food systems that we all already have, but you know, I guess in reality, they're not optimized when they're so reliant on, on this uh, dwindling water resource. And you know, my concern when we talk about food resiliency going forward, if, if nations want to secure uh, their, their food supplies. You know, the idea of importing almonds from California or, uh, or the little, you know, blueberries from some other, you know, we're not going to have the same choice. We're going to have to make yeah. changes in our, in our food, uh, food options. So maybe it is maybe yeah. a good time for us to, to rethink a lot of these uh, easy gains. Our speaker last week sort of talked about, uh, in regards to climate, the project drawdown activities, uh, the dietary shift from meat to yeah. veg. Uh, has, yeah, has a massive potential on redu reduction of CO2. Oh, I mean, it's amazing, right? But like, how do you get people to do that? Right. Inform yeah. them just what you're doing, Jay. Yep, we have to. We have to stay at it, and um, that's all you can do. Yep. Yeah, I think that's it. And so that maybe there's the message right there to to especially for the young folks that are that are yeah. listening in. You got to do your work and work hard. And again, I'm not saying we all need to go out there and shoot off our mouths. I think we need to do really hard work and then communicate about it when we come into something that's compelling or important and urgent. Um, that's all we can do. We just got to keep at it and, and, you know, do what some of the older folks on the phone are doing, on the call are doing, which is keep training the next generation, right? We just keep at it. We build the army and, and, you know, we will make a difference. We just, I think, all want it to happen sooner, and it should happen sooner, but, you know, we'll get there. Jay, uh, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to, you know, virtually visit us uh, from, from many thousands of kilometers away. That's one of the great uh, opportunities that this terrible crisis has had. It's brought people from all over the world to uh, uh, able to share their, their wisdom and uh, insight. So, uh, again, thank you very much for, for spending the time. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'll forward them to you. I know you'll be happy to uh, to answer those. I will. Before we catch up again, Jay, uh, it's a pleasure. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Everyone, uh, the, the presentation will be recorded. I'll have an email uh, sent out the next week or so once it's um, once it's edited for the, uh, for the uh, web uh, delivery. Uh, with that, thanks, everyone, for their attendance. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Fantastic. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great talk.